toes are from from uh, from the road. And I got a lot of road dirt. That's right. And so what I've wanted to do is I wanted to ask Sam to come and talk to us about how to tune drums, what the differences are between drums, like the drums come in all different shapes and sizes. As you can see, we have a couple of different shapes and sizes right up here for us to mess around with. He's going to talk about um, drum heads because, as we know, they're very similar to the diaphragm of the microphone. They are what makes the sound. Um, and he's going to talk about uh, drum tuning because in the very near future, you all will be doing a multi-track recording project. And you will very, very likely, and I highly recommend you consider doing it with a drum set because of, of a class like this, right? This is your chance. So um, he's going to talk to you about how to make drums sound better. A lot of times, drummers do not know how to make their drums sound amazing, you know? And that's a real limitation because drums are the key to a recording of any type of modern recording. If there's going to be drums on it, they're going to be kind of the summation of the sound starts with the drum. So that's why they're so critical. I know you all read your chapters and you know that there's really, they're really critical to the sound. So that's why we're spending two hours today on drums. That's why we've hired Sam to come talk to us. And let's give it up for him. Hey, Sam Nance. Um, I guess, so I guess the objective today, um, I guess you've probably already talked to him a little bit about um, miking and making a really piece of ass kit sound pretty good. We're going to make a, a kit sound good first and then um, mic that, but um, generally, I guess what you're going to run into, like you said, most of the drummers that I have taught or run into in the studio have no idea. I mean, they just show up and play, and they've got no idea how, how to tune their kit. So they come in all different conditions. Um, most of the time, they sound like cardboard boxes or some kind of combination. Um, so the sound engineers that I've worked with, they know how, without even touching the drums, to at least give them something, you know, make them sound halfway decent, just, just with microphone techniques. Um, but today we're gonna, I'm gonna show you uh, some quick, easy s steps. I mean, it's, it's not rocket science by any means because I can do it. Um, so I mean, it's, it's relatively easy, it's cheap. Little household items like, you know, blankets and towels and things like that that can be used to muffle, uh, dampen the pitches on the drums. Um, first thing we're gonna work on is uh, bass drum. Snare drum and bass drum in, in your priority list Number one, um, if you don't have a good tight bass drum and a, and a good sounding snare, it doesn't matter what the rest of the kit sounds like. Doesn't I mean, it, it can be the difference in a, in a good recording or not. Um, it can it can totally overpower or or ruin the recording, especially with acoustic instruments. Just just the bass drum alone can you know if it doesn't have any punch or low end to it. It's ruined. I mean, you just don't have that pulse in a, in a song. You don't have that energy in a song. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take two different kits. We're going to sort of aim for this one to be more of a rock kit. Um, uh, think classic rock kind of sound. Um, you know, deeper sound, a, a bigger, larger sound. This, we're going to focus on being more of a jazz kit. Um, it has a totally different setup. It's a little bit smaller drums, uh, has a splashier sound. Um, they're tuned higher, it's a higher pitch to it. So, and you'll, you'll, you'll get to hear the differences. Before we do that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play this bass drum for you as it is, and um, just so you can hear it before and after. And then I'm gonna, we're gonna take it apart real quick, um, put a new head on it. Uh, I think in, in one of the chapters in your book, um, uh, one of the guys talks about um, what he does every time before he records, before he does a session. If, if they bring a kit to him, if they're not using his drums, which he actually prefers, if they bring in theirs, first thing he does is change all the heads on them. Um, it's just like guitar strings. Anybody play guitar in here? You know, I mean, it's, it's everything. Guitar players will change your strings all the time. If you're playing all the time, you're changing them all the time. Um, and just like guitars, you don't just change one string or... or you know, if you break a G, you don't just change the G. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to go through and change all of them. Replace them all, get fresh, everything. Same thing with the drums. A lot of it has to do with the tension, um, but mostly it's just, it's gonna give you a better sound when you can break it all down and then start from scratch and build it all back up again. Because you, you, you can get
get you tune the drums to each other. So, we'll start with the bass drum. That sounds like poop. Um, so what I'm going to do, first thing is take this resonant head off. This is, uh, the resonant head is not as important as the back head. As long as it doesn't have any holes in it, you're in good shape. You can, you can get something going. Um, if it's got some tears or some punctures, and even even some some hideous dents, you know, can can kind of ruin the sound. Um, at least that I go for. So, but in general, if if, it, if, you, if it's all intact, resonant head's fine. This actually looks like a, a batter head, but it'll work just fine. It'll it'll still vibrate, so um, it'll just be a little more muffled. Usually, the the resonant heads. Um, have this have more of uh, a thinner kind of membrane so that you get a lot more of that vibration. That's that's what gives you the tone. That's the difference between getting a, a, a boom, boom, or a boom, boom. That's what these resonant heads do on all the drums. All the drums on the bottom have resonant heads. If you get a drummer that doesn't have resonant heads, for some reason somebody a long time ago decided that would be cool, um, looks cool or whatever. It's really, really hard to mic. It's really, really hard to tune the drums, especially trying to get a natural pitch out of them. Um, but if that's what you get and you got to deal with it, um, stick with the single ply drum heads. And I think he talks about that in the book as far as like what he recommends. Um, really some of the cheapest drum heads can be the best ones because there's not a lot to them that don't have all the bells and whistles and all, all kinds of junk um, you know woven in it's, it's just it's just a thin membrane and, uh, how can you show if it's a resonant head it'll say they, they they on the boxes you know they designate them you know when they when the manufacturer has you know every Thing you could possibly imagine that, but they, they, they have them, and, and your salesperson or your website, wherever you go to, will designate them. You know, each each manufacturer has its own, you know, um, chart or code that they go by. Um, for instance, we've got one over here. This is a snare head. This is a coated batter head that you, you know, beat on. Like I said, that's that's more important, and we'll get to that in a minute. Here's a resonant head. This is going to be on the bottom of the snare. And you can feel the difference. What does having the uh, the mic hole in your bass room do? Good question. That's we're going to get to that too. Um, most of the most of the sound guys that, that I've dealt with, um, this is what they prefer, especially live. You know, when we're talking about recording um, in this large room. We're talking about studio recording right now, but, you know, most of my experience, I, I've done a lot of studio and session work, but most of my experience is live performance, and this is what, you know, gets the job done. It's just light years easier to, to uh, control from the board what this sounds like when you can shove a microphone in it, as opposed to sticking it out here, you know, or put, putting it up against where the pedal hits. I mean, it's just... You know, it's just it's a lot easier. So it's it's all about control. Um, all these bass drums, all the, all the hardware works the same. Um, you know, it's it's just basic screws that that have these you know these, these wing nuts um, that are that apply the tension to the head on these rims. They all work that way. Most of the drums. Are like this. They'll have. A, we'll, we'll, I'll show you the lugs on here, and you get a drum key. They're universal. Um, Graham, <laughs> we got this sonar kit. For some reason, we were talking about this earlier. Just to be different, they decided to have different hardware, so they've got a whole different scheme going on. But it's still the same principle. It's just screws and <coughs> tension on the heads. When you know, I mean, that sounds that sounds stupid and easy, you know. 
but you'd be surprised how many people just don't get that the whole idea is to apply even pressure, you know, to, to get that membrane um, to have even pressure all, all on all those points so that you can have a good natural tone. If you've got, you know, I, I can't tell you how many kits I've run into where they're, half of them are just hanging off. You know, some of them are tight, and then the ones over here are loose. This is what we got dampening the, the bass drum in here. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Anything you can find. That's, that's a custom that's that's a custom dampening system that I've, I've designed. Anything you can find. That's a perfect example. It doesn't matter. Um, in, the, in your textbook, it talks about um, bath towels, you know, folding some bath towels. And the cool thing about that, and that's a great idea, is it's really simple to just add one more if you need another one. Or and you go back and play it and say, no, I need one more. And you can kind of listen. A lot of it's taste. You know, um, some people like a deader sound. You're going to be dealing with your drummer. You know, you're going to ask your drummer. Um, he's more than likely going to have a strong opinion about it. Um, so he wants a deader sound. You just throw on some more bath towels. Make sure they're pressed up against the, the batter head more. Um, and for that more, more of a ring, more of a na nice natural ring, you, you're going to push those towels away from the, the, the batter head. Um, that's if you don't have any time to go to Walmart. If you got time to go to Walmart and you got 12 bucks, you can get some of this stuff. And this stuff works so much better. And it looks nicer. Um, not that you can see in here, but a lot of heads, a lot of drums are clear, or they have the big holes in them you can see. Um, but this is a, we're talking about control. This is a great way to control the dampening of the bass drum. And it's cheap, so it doesn't matter if you, it's not a blank, you know, like some nice quilt or something that a lot of people use. You just cut this thing up, fit it to size. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to estimate, save some time here. I'm going to use probably, I'm going to start out with one strip, um, and I guess this is what, is, is this, what do you think, 16 inches deep, about 16 inches? Um, you, the, the idea is you don't want to cut it too narrow. It, it has to be touching both heads. Um, so you want to cut it, you know, wide enough or deep enough that when you put this one, when you put both heads back on, that it's that it's up against both. Um, that's the whole idea. If you have if you have something where it's not touching, you're going to get kind of that warped sort of bow, you know, that kind of sound, which we don't want. We want to, you know, we want a punch. We want a deep punch that has a little tone to it. Um, I also went and got. Uh, the bass drum head that I recommend for any occasion. Um, most of the other heads I'm not as picky about. They're, <laughs> all the manufacturers have, you know, a, a single ply head and a two ply head. Um, they all come in coated or clear. I mean, all your manufacturers have that. But this one manufacturer does a great job with bass drum heads. And you can take any cheap kit, I'm talking like a beginner drum set, $300 kit out of a JCPenney catalog, put that head on, or that, that drum head on it, you know, for 15 minutes of, of TLC, you've got a really good sounding bass drum. It's, it really isn't very hard at all. And it's almost like magic, you know, when you, when you play that and show, show that to a drummer, a lot of these guys have struggled their whole lives trying to get a good sound out of their bass drum. And uh, it's just a really simple fix. It's, it's one of the more expensive drum heads, um, but it's worth it. And it sucker never breaks. Um, one of the kits I, I tour with has one of these on it. I've replaced it once, and that's just because I felt like it was kind of kind of getting worn down. But and, and we're talking about. 600 shows or so, or so, you know, and, and I never had to replace it. So you get your money's worth. How much? 
50 bucks, which that's, that's pretty steep for drum heads. It's another thing, drum heads really aren't that expensive. Um, I mean, when you gotta change them all out, you gotta get a ton of them, but individually, you know, the, and like I said, the cheap ones are great. Um, they work just fine. I'm talking like 10 bucks a piece, maybe. So. What was that called again? What's that? This is a, an Aquarian. Aquarian. Uh, it's, it's Super Kick 2. They have different models. They have Super Kick 3. They may even have a 4. And all that is talking about is how, uh, how much padding this head has on it. If you look at this, they've come a long way in the past you know, 20, 25 years in manufacturing these heads. See this stuff, you know, 20 years ago, we were having to do that with just tape, you know, some duct tape and a piece of cloth here and there. And yeah, I mean, you know, it, you, you, you work with what you got. Um, but every once in a while, you know, you get a drummer that starts manufacturing things. He knows what, what we need and you get something like this. Uh, like I said, this thing is, is great. It's going to take me a second to get this on and put this uh, Sam, this is up in here. This is when we should say something like, if anybody's watching on the internet from Aquarium, Sam, <laughs> Sam plays with Brass 5 and, you know. Yeah, that's right. I guess I gotta say something about Yamaha drums too. <laughs> I never play Pearl drums. I only play Yamaha. <laughs> um, that's another, I, I, that raises a good point. Drum sets does make a difference and stuff. Yes and no. I mean, there's there's different woods. You know, there's maple and cherry and whatever else, birch and stuff. Different um, plies and, and, and things. And yeah, it can create warmer sounds and richer tones and stuff like that. 80% 80, 80 of it, at least, is drum heads and tuning. So when you get that drummer that's bragging about his, you know, $1,200 um, whatever, or some drummer that's got a you know, $3,500 DW kit that's all maple shells and, you know, and everything, it does, you know, listen to the drum heads. How does he tune his drum heads? Because he may be wasting that kit, you know. Questions? I'm trying to think of things that, that I've run into, problems that I've run into, but um, usually I just get to hear kind of the, the complaints from the sound sound guys, you know, about stories about uh, you know the kits that they get. Like I said, I mean, well, that's a good point. Like, like, like things that things that people complain about, you know, yeah. like, like, uh, and and things that you could be listening for that you might complain about, you know, like, uh, for example, every time you hit that kick drum, every other drum that you have resonates really loudly, you know, like that's a problem, you know, if you're hitting the kick drum and the snare drum goes, you know, I mean, that's, yeah. that's an issue. And sometimes, sometimes it's the room you're in. Um, I can tell you right now, this room, everything we do is going to make those snare drums go off. They're going to go berserk. Um, you've got you've got some control though. I love playing in this room just because there's no there's no slap back, but it's got a lot of that open kind of reverb. Brass players love playing in this room um, just for that reason. But at the same, you know, that just goes hand in hand with, the, with what he was saying with the snare drums. You're playing off, you know, when I, when I go into a studio, a sucker is wall-to-wall -wall carpet. Um, now, I'm sure you, you've had a lot more experience, you know, recording in, in um, performance halls and chambers like that. Um, my, my experience is, you know, separate rooms with soundproof doors and, you know, wall-to-wall -wall carpet, ceiling carpet. Um, it, again, it's about control, wouldn't you say? It's just you control the environment. You know, then then you can do whatever you want with the technology that you have. 
you even make it, you can make the room sound like whatever you want. It may not be as authentic, but um, it's easier to, you know, deal with these factors, you know, these drums that can be a, a pain in the butt. So what are you looking for when you when you place that rim? Up this up is, top um, of the head? you know, it, it's a tw this is a 22 inch um, bass drum, which is standard. Um, this one's smaller. I think it was a 20 or I think that's an 18. 18? Is it 18? Um, it's 18 or 20? I don't know. This this is is your standard bass drum right here. I mean, you know, most of the time, most of the kits you're going to run into is 22 inch. Um, I guess they just found that that's kind of gives the most uh, that most uh, desired sound that, that everybody's sort of looking for, or at least it can kind of kind of go in the middle ground. Um, you know, we're talking about depth and punch <coughs> and stuff like that. Um, this one's higher, like we were I was saying before. This is more of a jazz kit. It's going to have a higher. Uh, everything's going to be tuned to a higher pitch frequency. So, um, you know that that they go with the smaller heads on those kits, but they're not as they're not as common. Um, when you put when you put putting these heads on, it's real simple. I mean, they they like I said, everything is there's a there's a uh, standard cut to these drums, and the head just plops right on there, fits pretty snugly, and then with this uh, hoop, um, the hoop. And the screws here, the wing nuts, are what apply that tension, and just and it gives you that instead of just the screws, you know, just at these points giving tension, the whole hoop is evenly distributing that that pressure around the drum. That's a fulcrum, isn't it? I'm gonna get somebody to help me in a second. Um, how easy, how easy is it? Um, it happens, you know, I, it's not going to happen from just sitting around and playing it. It's usually, it's, it's more um, reasonable to, or uh, feasible that it's like, you know, dropped or something like that where then you can get some cracks and um, certainly temperature has a, has a, you know, um, you got, if, if you got somebody that's, 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 a really good example is if you've got somebody that's um, coming to the studio, they've had their drums in their car all day and it's 32 degrees outside, bring it into your nice room temperature studio, things, <coughs> things are going to be a little weird. Um, there may, you may just, it may just be a matter of just going through and kind of quickly retuning everything. Again, no different than a, than a stringed instrument. Um, the cold air contracts, you know, everything contracts, the metal, everything. Hot air, it expands. I've played gigs outside in the summer, and it's been a nightmare because as I'm playing, I mean, in the middle of a song, I'll hear these, these heads just start to kind of sink in, and turn to mush. is when you when you tuning them or putting new heads on when you're starting from scratch <coughs> most of the time the idea is to just get things finger tight don't tighten anything um, beyond finger tight until you get everything all the lugs in so that you have like a, a kind of an even starting point and then you're going to go back and forth and kind of crisscross pattern tightening the head. This is going to 
gonna sound, this, this drone's gonna sound so much better. <coughs> now your batter head um, on your bass drum is gonna be tighter than your resonant head. Your resonant head, you just want it tight enough that there's no wrinkles. Um, because you want it to resonate. You want that low sound. You don't want a high pitched sound on, on that resonant head. Um, the batter head, same thing. Start out just ironing out wrinkles, you know, adjusting. You can see it when it's got a pucker or a wrinkle in it. And then you're just gonna kind of get it going a little bit. And we're gonna leave it right there. So that's with nothing in it. If I was to put this resonant head back on, tighten it, it would ring for a day and a half. Um, that's what those resonant heads do. It really, it just that, that sound just vibrates off that off that resonant head and just goes forever. So now we're gonna put this sucker in here. that's gonna rub up against the, uh, the resonant head. The reason I'm not just folding it over, because then it's just flapping around in there. Um, it also will sit still a little better in here if you, if you kind of get it a little bit halfway fitted to the drum. Um, when you figure out what works, and if it's your drum kit, you can uh, eventually glue this sucker in here. Because, um, you know, once you figure out what you like, you just leave it. You just leave it in there. And you can change out the heads and stuff, but um, the other thing is getting that double-sided uh, Velcro, you know, just getting some of that stuff, sticking it in here. Um, the reason being is it'll sit fine as it is, but when you transport these things, they're all upside down or anything, and then you get this happening um, with, with your heads put back on there. It's just a pain in the butt, because then you gotta redo everything. Okay, like I said, this is a batter head, but we're gonna use it as a resonant head. And you can see it's got this extra piece on the inside. That's for dampening. Um, but it'll still it'll still sound fine on this B usually do that. No, usually use a resonant head, not a uh, not a batter head. Like I said, that you use what you got to work with, um, and, and as long as there's no big rips or wrinkles where the thing is fluttering, no matter how you tune it, it just keeps fluttering. Um, that's sort of that's sort of where you kind of have to draw the line. Not really much you can do about it. You got to have something and you, what you can do what I have done before when I when when I have no options I can't you know they don't want to buy they don't have the money to get another resident head or you don't have time you can reinforce those those warped uh, dents and wrinkles with some tape so they don't flutter you know um, it's just a pain in the butt when, when you're when you're trying to get a good sound out of the, out of the drum, and, you, and you, you know you've done everything right, but you still get that, you know, you get that, that vibration because there's wrinkles and stuff in that resonant head. All 
All right, let me get somebody to come, come help me. So this Billy Green. Just grab a wing nut, make sure it's got the washer on it still. And like I said, just go, just go finger tight. Righty tighty loose, lefty loosey. Just go into it until it's not moving around anymore. <laughs> Spencer, you need to get up there too. They need me. They don't need you. This is the, um, like I said, this is the most important drum, next to the snare drum. It also takes the longest. The other ones don't take nearly as long. So you won't uh, have to sit through all that. Now, uh, the downside to cutting a hole in that resident head what would be what? What would be the downside of this being here? Remember we were talking about with the resident heads? Of the hole, you said? Yeah, the hole. Well, if you don't have goggles anymore, hmm? wouldn't that uh, like goggles It's not, or exactly. You're not going to get the, the, the quality. You're not going to get the tone quality. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Um, so acoustically, you know, this, this drum kit, just playing acoustically without any miking or anything, um, you know, practicing with somebody or whatever, playing in a room, it's not going to sound as good um, as, as, a, as a bass drum. It's not going to be easy, as easy to sound good as a bass drum with the resonant head intact. So, some people are reluctant to put the put that microphone hole um, on a resident head, and that's the reason. So I've got a drum kit, it's one of the main one I use, um, that I, I don't have a microphone hole in it because I rarely use it to record. Um, it's usually primarily just as a, uh, used as a performance, live performance drum kit. So. <coughs> You can sort of feel which ones, if there's any, uh, you know, if they're, if they're really loose, you, you just want to make sure they're not going to move on you. You don't want to crank down, like I said, this is the resin head, you don't want to crank down tension on it. You just want it to where they're not going to move anymore and slide out as you play. Now we can adjust the batter head to fit our taste. Um, in, again, in the textbook, what he suggests is doing the, basically taking these steps. Um, and, uh, and then sticking, the, sticking your bass drum pedal on there and playing it, um, and then miking it. Once you've got it to where you, you like it acoustically, then mic it and then make some more modifications if you want once you listen to it recorded. So he can hear how it balances with the rest of the group, how, how it sounds against a bass player. You know, is it covering, covering up the tone of the bass player? Um, is it providing that punch that they need in the song? So it has a punch, you know, it sounds like a cannon. Um, this room, of course, amplifies it, but it doesn't have a warped sound. It doesn't, it rings, but it doesn't go brow. It just goes boom. Doesn't sound like a cardboard box either. It doesn't sound just like a, um, which is what you'll run into most of the time. So, 
like I said, the bass drum, it's not, it's not a lot to it once you know the, just the simple steps, if you can, if you can get the right equipment. Um, again, we use this stuff, but a pillow will work. Um, pillows are a little harder to control because they're thicker. Um, I like this stuff because it's, you can kind of really push it up against the, 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 the shell of the drum. <laughs> and you can add and take away this a lot easier. You can trim it with your scissors or whatever. Um, but, you know, most people will use blankets and pillows and towels. You say you wear them uh, inside, touching both of those mm -hmm. things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like creeping up the sides of the room. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, you can see inside here how it's yeah. right up against it. You see? See how it's already falling, falling down a little bit, too. Um, that's not ideal, but... It doesn't hurt it. I mean, it's okay. Um, we can go up or down from there as far as, like I said, as far as taste and pitch is concerned. We'll worry about that when we get our snare drum going because you can sort of, you can sort of make your mind up how you want this to sound. I've already tuned this snare. Thank God. So, um, not the way to sit through that. Um, but I am going to show you. I'm going to the, the snare is a little tricky just because it's got an actual snare on the bottom. Um, but I'm going to show you how this sounds. And you can we can make adjustments once you've got once you put it in context. In other words, you put it in, in the context of the other instruments that it plays with in, in combo with. Hi-hats here and bass is perfect. And depending on your drummer, the other thing is a lot of drummers, some drummers have a weak foot, you know. They may be marching band geeks or something. They didn't really play trap set very much. So they got really, really good chops with their sticks, but they might have a weak foot. So maybe they need a little more punch, you know. Um, there's, a, there's adjustments they can make to their pedal to do that, but a lot of things you can do with the bass drum. Or maybe the guy's just heavy footed, you know, he's got his double bass and stuff. Maybe we need to dampen it a little more because he's just all over, you know, all over that bass drum. This sucker's, you know, vibrating too much. If you get too much of that, um, that tone, that microphone's gonna pick it up, you know. And then we can just back off some. We can dampen this a little more. Um, we can we can tighten it up a little bit so it's not ringing so much. And that really, if we tighten this resonant head, that will dramatically reduce the amount of ring that you're getting. The batter head, it's more about the tone, the pitch, you know, whether it's high or low. This is gonna this is gonna reduce the length um, you know that resonant residency whatever whatever. Alright um oh yeah snare drum so here's our torn apart snare drum this is the, the same snare drum as that right there um, this is just a standard snare drum, 14 inches in the head. This is our batter head, what you, what's left of it. That's what you're going to run into a lot. You're not going to run into drummers that, you know, have brand new shiny heads all the time. Um, and if you have to, you can, you can make this work. There's no tears in it. There's no punctures. It's going to sound pretty yucky. Um, you can see how th this is all worn off. The reason that they have coated heads um, really, it really goes back to brushes. You've seen drummers use brushes 
um, to get that sweet sort of sound, that stirring kind of, um, you know, brushing sound that, that you get with those. You want that coated head because it provides that resistance. Um, when, the, when that wears off, you know, brushes don't, you know, aren't going to be as loud, but that's about it. It's not going to affect somebody playing with drumsticks. It's not going to change the sound. Um, so this would still work. This would work just fine. This is gross. Um, but that will affect, you know, obviously that, a, a, an, inch of, an inch of dust will definitely affect a resonant head. All right, so you see how this, this, is, this is a snare. This is the resonant head. This is the bottom of it, obviously. Um, you see how thin this is. This is like, it almost feels like wax paper. I mean, it's really thin. And that, when it's tightened with this slapped up against it, when they vibrate together, that gives you that real crispy sound. Um, and I'm going to show you how to kind of get this back in the, in the right position. But for now, we obviously had to take this off to, to remove this. You have to pull this out, and it just, you just weave it through here. I think it is, yeah, 1946. Alright. I want to give you, I'm you know. I'm touching probably like some, some dead, you know, dead guy here. It's like a layer, it's like four years worth of skin and hair. Now this is what you're going to run into. Yes, you will. Right? I, I don't have to clean this up right now. <laughs> nope, whatever you want to do. All right. So where are those heads we were passing around a minute ago? That's, that's what we're going to put on here. You can just stay right here. You just, volu just volunteer. <laughs> so we put our resonant head on there first. And, we, and we, obviously we've got to line this up back over here where our, where our hardware it is that holds our snare on there. So. Normally, I wouldn't go another step until I clean this thing with some cleaner and then some polish, 409, and a little grease lightning, and some antibacterial soap. It's got so much character. It really does have character. That's right. I know it is. I don't got a place. So finger tight, no tighter than unless you have gorilla hands. You don't want to. I can't even do it to like thread. Yeah, you just wiggle until you feel it. if it's. Yeah, it's just it's rusty. You know what I mean? yeah. um, a lot of these still have. We'll have a little bit of you know like bearing grease in there, so that they'll they'll go in pretty good and it stays pretty greasy. Forever. Uh, so we're going to weave this back in. Make sure it's not upside down. That does make a difference. Um, I guess the difference is if it's upside down, your snares aren't going to be flush up against the, uh, they're not going to properly sit against the the head. We've got a couple of bent snares here. When, when it gets tight, that should, should iron out a little bit. But a lot of times, if you get real big crinks, or you, you'll, you'll find some that are just completely loose, cut those suckers off. It's not going to hurt the thing to lose you know, three or four of these snares. It's, it really won't. Sometimes it makes it sound even better, especially for rock. Um, but you don't want to leave them dangling. That's going to be a giant pain in the neck when you when you start getting all that vibration. Talk about something that you can't control. That's that's it right there. Okay, this wasn't threaded through here. It looks like it was just draped over. So that's what I'm gonna do work for now. Let's see. No, I'll just take the knot out. Put it in. Most of the snares nowadays have a, a 
piece of ni uh, nylon or um, a strip. It looks like a piece of tape that, that comes off here, so you're not dealing with strings and knots and things like that. These older snares, though, they use just good old strings. See these? This is gonna have to go through these, weave through these holes, and then I'm gonna tie some knots, and that'll keep, keep the tension. Yeah. I'm trying to remember my square knot in the time to get here. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm doing. There she is. It's my granny right there. Oh, better. There we go. Right on. There's a square knot. Right on. All right. So I just I just bypassed our little holes there because it's strings and paper. Okay. Um, all right, now you see I left too much slack here, so what's going to happen is when I get this thing tight, look how far over it's going to be. So I need to put these things in first. It's always that much of a pain in the ass. It is, it really is. But you know what? You, you, that's when you work with so many different types of drums and snares, and I mean they're you know they're all unique and they all have different hardware. This one's going to weave down. Through this, this this little catching device right here, these screws tighten down and and keep the tension on it. Um, it's a lot of little stuff. So we get our screwdriver. <laughs> Normally, this is the only part of the drum that you're going to use a screwdriver, a Phillips or a flathead screwdriver for. Everything else is is lugs that we use our drum key with or the wing nuts like our bass drum. So we know the snare is going to be about right in there. You want it even on both sides. We don't want it tight all the way, and I'll show you why in a minute. If you've noticed, these snare drums, you can turn them on and off by applying we have this little one lever here. You see how uh, there's an example of the little nylon strip there. Um, that's loose, and then when you pull that lever up, it, it applies the pressure to, to put that snare tight against the, the bottom. So that's what we're going for here. The snare is off; should be off once once we get everything tied and tied up. Um, will be off and this should be a little loose. Not a lot loose, just a little loose. So that it, when, when it's upside down, you know, gravity makes the snares not touch the, uh, the resonant head. It's, it's as simple as that. So what are the two most important drums? And snare drum. Snare. So we'll spend as much time as we can on this. How's our time, Graham? We're doing okay. We're doing if you okay. wanted to, um, maybe Mike, maybe do the bass drums and start kind of going through that, and and, um, and then I'll get right to the to the toms over there on that drum drum Good. kit, and we'll have that drum kit done. All right. Um, the snare drum, like I said, snare is already ready. Yeah. There's nothing you do to cymbals, by the way. You can polish them or whatever, but their cymbals are idiophones. They have the same pitch. I did bring some moon gel. 
moon gel. It does. It sounds like some really cool stuff. It looks like um, bubble gum or something, but you can put it in your mouth unless you really want to. Um, the moon gel, some, some clever little dude came up with. It's a great way to dampen your cymbals or your, or your drums without overdoing it. Snares resonating with other stuff. I'll point out. I played in a band in high school with, with the, the baritones that set the snares off constantly. Yeah. How do you stop that? Turn it off. <laughs> you know. Um, again, in a in a studio, um, you got separate rooms okay. and uh, barriers, uh, sound screens, whatever, whatever you can do to separate because you don't want to kill the drum. You know what I mean? You can you can tighten a sucker so it doesn't vibrate when when other instruments play, but then it's not going to sound quite as snary, you know. For rock, it's that's okay. You can kind of you can mess with it. You get into jazz though, especially with some jazz Nazis, they're not going to be too happy about that. <coughs> this sucker's really stubborn, but I think it's just the rust on it. Okay, so that's not going to be, probably not going to be tight enough, but we don't know yet until we tighten this head all the way. Drum key. All right, here's your drum key. Um, this is a fancier one because it's a ratchet key, but they, they fit all these little lugs. And we already got this finger tight, so I'm just going to go around in a crisscross pattern. I don't crank them down, I just get them to where I can feel a little tension. Again, it's just kind of a, it's a feel thing. Um, Exactly to dimension. You know, you have 14 inch snares, you have 13 inch snares, you have all kinds of, you know, little piccolo snares and popcorn snares. I'm sure you're using, you know, drummers using lots of different effects and stuff. Um, so you have different size snare drums. This is your standard 14 inch, but um, but they do. They cut, they make those heads, you know, with laser precision and they, they should fit every drum. Even these really old ones it should be pretty, pretty daggone tight. Um, oh, while we're doing this, here's a dampener right here that's built into the snare drum. Um, the one I play um, is a Yamaha, and uh, it doesn't have this in it. Um, I actually prefer it not to. Um, it's just another piece of junk to rattle inside there, but I use, my, I use the moon gel on mine, and I'll show you what that junk is in a minute. But um, this is the same, it serves the same purpose by, by turning this knob. See how it starts to rise up? I don't know if you can see that rise up. See it going up? That's going to put a plot pressure to the head and dampen in the head. It's not going to ring as much. So a lot of, a lot of drums have these, or uh, snare drums have these in them. Um, and a lot of them don't. I think this one does not. So I use moon gel with that one. You can also buy you know, they sell these that, that clamp onto a drum, onto the side of it. I, saw, I heard somebody say they, they use towel, like little you know, pieces of towel, like cloth and stuff. That's another um, kind of an old school trick. You know, you, know you, can, you can take a thin piece of cloth, just a thin strip, you know, from a t-shirt or something, and just, if you don't have anything else to work with, and, and before you put the head on, you just drape it across, um, just like this, that snare was. Just drape it across and, and just let it kind of loosely fall, and then put your head, head on and, and tighten it up. And then you have this thin strip to, to dampen. My drum teacher 
That, and, and essentially, that's what that moon gel does. Same thing, only you can take it on and off. You know, it um, lasts for a long time. So we're we're yeah. Just a little um, what what they have now? Another cool little thing is these these little plastic rings. These I love. For <coughs> these are are great. They go right. Fit again, they fit to the drum. This one's a 16 inch it's for a floor top and it fits right inside the hoop. Um, if it doesn't have any bins or crinkles like this one does, it'll lay flat and not buzz. And what it does is it dampens without stealing the tone of the drum. So you don't, again, you don't get that bow, bow, you get a boom, boom. You know, a lot of drummers. Don't want to boom. They want to. I don't know why, but somewhere along the line, somebody told them that's what, what was okay. Um, maybe they, you know, through a, a, a reasonable debate, you can convince them to on some some middle ground or something. But um, it's not a whole lot you can do with with a drum that's completely dead. It's gonna sound like it's gonna sound like somebody in stomp or something playing on a bucket. It's not gonna it's not gonna sound very good. But I'm sure you guys can do miraculous things with microphones these days. So <laughs> you can come up with something. All right. Now this is, again, just like the bass drum, your snare head is gonna be cranked on there pretty good. Have a lot of tension on it. It gives it a really high pitch. Um, some, some drummers like theirs tighter than others. You don't have to be quite as, if you're dealing with old heads, you start from, you just you break it down. I'll show you in a minute with the tom. Start from scratch. You're still gonna do, we're gonna go through the same steps, even though we're not replacing the heads. We're gonna go back and start from scratch. It's easier to just loosen everything, take it apart, and put it back together than it is to sit there and try and just you know kind of match up tones and stuff as it, as it is right now. Um, you can get a, just a quicker, even, more even sound by just taking it apart and starting from scratch. But you don't have to be as one thing I you know in that in that book it talks about doing this crisscross and applying the even toning and pressure. If they're old heads, don't worry about it. Just throw the thing on there and start cranking because they've already been stretched. You know they've already they've been on there. They've been beaten on and whatever. They've already been stretched out. These new ones though, just like guitar strings, will go in and out. Even the even today after we do this and play on it a little bit. Um, you probably want to go back and do it again just a little bit. <coughs> Alright, so now you know this is going to be this. So, and rather than mess with any of this, I'm going to do this because it's easier. I'm going to loosen these screws. Just tug on these strings a little bit. Oh, make sure snare's off first. So you have some slack. And we're gonna tug on that just a little bit. Small adjustments. That way you don't have to go back and forth trying to figure out what it is. Lighten that back up.
guys, I know some of you do. Do you all play instruments? No? No? Um, sometimes that just having that kind of sensitivity, you know, just knowing pitches and, um, can, can help. You know, you, you, even if you're not a drummer, you can tell when something is, you know, when, when two pitches are, are colliding, what do they do? They vibrate, right? And it's, and it's, pretty, it's pretty obvious, pretty awful. You get something that's really, sounds really good, whether it's in thirds or fifths, you know, harmonizing kind of tones and stuff. It's not going to be that precise with drums, but you can tell. Okay, we're getting closer. All right, you can hear this, um, this snare head without any, without this <coughs> on at all. I'm going to tighten this up a little bit. So now it's pressing against it. You can actually see it through the head. It's pressing against it. Not ringing as long. So when you when the snare is off, you shouldn't hear any snare. You shouldn't hear any of the. Zzz. That's a little too close to the head. And some of it's because it's because it's still bent. I mean, you just gotta experiment. Get better. Um, you know, you kind of get hot and cold. You know, you can tell if it's if you if you keep doing keep doing something, you're tightening and it's sounding crappier. Then go the other direction. I'm changing pitch right now, and but but if you'll notice what was happening earlier, what I was hearing and I was getting a little nervous about was this wasn't tight enough, and because this head wasn't tight enough, I kept it too loose. Dude, your snares, the snares weren't vibrating tightly; they were vibrating slow. Um, I mean, we're talking about you know I don't know the science behind it or anything, but we, you know a. a a different milliseconds, but they're vibrating so, so much slower that you're not getting a crisp pop. You're getting a... So tightening that bottom head can make those snares actually sound like they're, they're crispier. So how would you characterize the sound right now? It's more for like kind of that standard, just of standard rock. Um, pretty dry. Um, you know, straightforward kind of kind of sound, um, easy to mic. There's not a lot of overring. You know, this this jazz kit is going to be a little different because it's it's like I said, it's soupy, it's flashier. You know, it has a just more natural resonance to it. Um, it's going to be a little drier. Um, some people like that combination. Um, talking about like. Uh, John Bonham and some, you know, some famous drummers from the seventies who sort of had that. You're playing on some jazz kits, you know, or some <coughs> band style kits, but using them for rock. It had a cool sound. I mean, it was just a cool combination. 
Um, so what's that? Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, that's come back in style now. Um, uh, with a lot of the it, Mars Volta, that guy plays a huge drum set. The, the indie rock um, and modern rock and stuff. The the new thing. I mean, even with like your your emo kind of groups and stuff, um, like the Killers and people like that. The, the drummers have gone to these old school kind of classic setups with their kits. Real big, deep kind of sound, um, soupier, splashier sound. Um, you know, in the '90s, it was different. It was a different thing. It was like kill your drums. Make them sound as you know dead as possible. That might be a good segue point. Is is uh, you know the style of music oftentimes dictates how you're going to tune these drums. You know when uh, when uh, Primus came out, you know everybody thought, man, that's kind of weird. He was using a real small piccolo snare tuned up real high, and they were playing like heavy rock stuff, and it sounded it was so unique that it was almost their own yeah. sound. And that you know? goes to with. with with who he's playing with. He's playing with uh, Claypool, who's he, his, he's extremely in a mid-range bass sound. You know, it's, he doesn't play that low kind of, you know, uh, lower, I'm trying to think uh, like U2, like Adam Clayton or something. He plays that real kind of low filling bass. Uh, Claypool is, he's playing a lot more, he's a lot busier. It's, and when you know this stuff, it really makes a difference. You know, he's, he's playing, he's covering so much mid-range stuff um, and it's busier stuff. So. You're gonna match the the, the bass drum and, and the and the snare and things like that. Want to they want to you want to complement each other. Um, you want to sound like you're meant to be together. You know. Um, so I know like in that case, the snare. What he was talking about is meant to like be higher. It's, yeah, it's real high pitch. Yeah. There was like more space it's for a, it. It's to a real high pitch yeah. kind of pop. To it. And I think you're gonna find that on your projects. You know, you might find when you're recording a band, for example, that the drum tuning may not complement the style of music that they're doing, or may not complement, you know, whatever. There's heavy bass, there's distorted bass, you know, maybe you want the, the kick to be bigger, you know, or the kick to be smaller. It's just all kind of dependent on the on the sounds that you're you're hearing, right? I'll tell you another thing that's, that's sort of come just in the last, you know, uh, five or six years is that that sort of crappy garage band kit, drum kit, applied against some more modern, you know, music with, you know, lots of keyboards and stuff like that. It sounds really cool. I mean, it, it really does. It, and it's a sort of, you know, a few years ago, a decade ago, playing against some music that's much more um, tight and syncopated and stuff, it wouldn't sound that great because it's so... The lo-fi sound, yeah. yeah that's good We're getting into some, you know, real... Well, the book specifically stuff. talks about some some ideas, um, you know, in the, in the later pages that I, I made you guys read this for this time. Um, <coughs> talks about how to get the 70s sound, right, and the reggae sound, and like different types of tuning, but also different type of miking techniques. So, um, does anybody remember the first thing that it says to do with a drum set when you get ready to mic them? Some serious readers right here. Play it. Play it. Fair enough. Let's, let's go ahead and play this. All right, you want to, when you use this, the yeah, drum, we just... Yeah, I pulled that one out. So the other thing that it suggests is, is to um, take a single large diaphragm condenser microphone, place it about 8 to 10 feet away from uh, the drummer's uh, head, right? And, and that's how it should be spaced in terms of height. And listen to if you hear anything in particular that jumps out in the drum set. And that's a bad thing. You don't want, like for example, one cymbal to be louder than the rest of them. You don't want one tom to be louder than the rest of them. So those are the type of things that we're going to start off listening for. So we're going to start off listening for, is this drum set even? Is there something we can do, right? Is the snare drum tuned too high? Does the snare drum jump out as opposed to the rest of the kit? Is the snare drum not loud enough compared to the rest of the kit? A little side note as he's getting set up, when I, um, when I went and tried out all these cymbals, these Bosco cymbals, one of the first things I did was I chose the hi-hat cymbal first. And then I chose the rest of the cymbals based upon whether they would fit in with that hi-hat, right? I mean, that's like my third most, most high priority. The hi-hat would hit more than any, other, any of the other things, right? The hi-hat is like the timekeeper. It's always in there. So the hi-hat volume is really important, the tone and the volume. So 
that's one of the things that we're going to be listing for. You notice I have a couple of cymbals set up here, a couple of hi-hats set up here. We're going to be listing for, is everything at an even volume, you know? Maybe not all the drummers that you're going to work with has this much equipment to kind of mess around with, but these are the type of things that you need to be listening for. And I think that when you start to listen to music this way, you'll start to hear that the snare drum's different. Maybe, maybe you're listening to a, uh, a killer's record, right? Maybe they use different snares on every song, you know, and you start to hear the differences, that, right? Yeah, that's happening a lot more. <laughs> you know, maybe they use drum, a different drum kit on every song. You know, maybe they were going for a real big thing versus a real small thing. So, the things that we talked about recently, just to cap, just to kind of sum up, right, is new drum heads are really important. Like, when you get ready to, to do your session, ask your drummer to, to consider getting new drum heads, at least for the batter head on the kick drum and the batter head on the snare drum. You know, that, that would be really, really helpful for you. You know you're starting from a good place. The other thing that we want to talk to the drummers about is having their drum, drums be fairly well tuned. So part of that is you showing up early with just the drummer, okay? When I go to a session, I show up at least three hours early myself, okay? Then I ask the drummer to be there an hour and a half before we start. Because he and I are gonna work through all the details of his drum set before we go any further, you know? That's the core of the recording. So I wanna be there with the drummer, with no one else around, so that he and I, or she and I can work on the kit, get it tuned to where we think is a good place to start. Maybe have an, a couple additional snares ready to switch out, depending on which song it is, you know? A couple of extra cymbals. As an engineer, I bring my own cymbals. I was okay. going to say that that's another thing I liked about that guy in, in the textbook is, um, and I haven't seen often. Chick Korea brings his own cymbals to the session. Yeah, the, the guy has, has his, own, his own drum kit <laughs> there, and that's cool because he can offer. He has he can offer to say, look, man, why don't you why don't you try recording on the, on the kit that I know already? I already know this kit. I've mic'd it, I've played it, um, I've recorded it so often. Why don't you play on this kit? You know, I know you love your kit, but try this one too. Um, then you already know it. You know that kit in and out. You know you've, you've got experience with it and stuff. So if you have that luxury of already having a drum kit in there, so um, give us something. Uh, give us something kind of just normal. We're gonna we're gonna listen to the kit first. Everybody stand up. Let's get a little closer. I don't know how the video is going to deal with this, but we'll work around. <laughs> so we want to listen to this kit in this space first off. Okay. It may not be tuned perfectly. We're kind of ru rushing through to get to some microphone technique. So. We're just gonna have a simple four beat here and we're just gonna kinda listen to the kit. We're listening more to the kit to the, than to the room at this point, okay? What do you hear? What, how about levels? Hi-hat, kick, snare. Are they all pretty even? Kick's coming through really strong, yep. good deal. So what can we do to offset that? The kick is where it is, right? We're not gonna change the volume of the kit, I mean of the kick drum, right? So what I'm gonna suggest right off the bat is either he hit the snare drum harder or he muffles it less, okay? I wanna hear more of the snare drum tone. That would be my first thing, is to focus on getting more sound out of the snare drum right off the bat, okay? And I heard something that we were talking about earlier, This this lasted longer than anything else, didn't it? After I quit playing, this was still going. So what do we change? Batter head, we're gonna adjust this first. Cause it's what's ringing. It's what's giving you that tone. So he's gonna do some Just a little bit. To help small, me out, right? small adjustments. Listen, listen to your drummer too, because even though the drummers are idiots, um, Idiots can still have good ideas sometimes. Or they can at least, you can diagnose something. Just they play their drums a lot more than you do. Yeah. <laughs> and they, and they, you may not speak the same language, but you can listen to them if he's saying, you know, I want more skizazzle out of my snare drum, yeah. you know. What does that mean? Maybe he's... So, when we, when we, like you said, I'm going to take off this damper just a little bit.
Try that. Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, can you, can you turn it up possibly? Because there's a lot on the outside of the microphones that I think create 
Yeah, I mean, probably if you can't turn it up anymore there, you're just going to have to kind of cup it onto your head a little bit. That's, that's I think I'm maxed out on volume level. So, so um, I feel pretty comfortable with the drum sound so far. Um, again, this is just a starting point to help us determine what we're listening to, okay? So now, the first thing that the, uh, the microphone, I mean the uh, book suggests, is to place a large diaphragm condenser at the height above the snare equal to the width of the entire kit. And I may not have the right, uh, the right um, uh, piece for this, but we're going to give it a shot here. I don't know if you guys can hear also, but some of the some of the stuff that's going on here with that overtone with the overtones is actually this thing right here. You can, it, well, it's not doing it as much now because I'm tight in the heads. But when I play this um, and these toms, this this thing's ringing. You know, it's having a, its own little solo session over here. So, <laughs> I don't know if this is gonna happen. I can't figure out how to use that clip. Let's try it now. So, we're trying some single microphone techniques. This one we're going to go in an equilateral triangle, as wide as the drum set is, right, as wide as the kit is, we're going to try and make an equilateral triangle to reach up to the center of how wide it is to the apex. Does that make sense? An equilateral triangle. And I don't know if this is actually going to get high enough to really do that exactly, but we're going to get pretty close anyway. And I may have to just hold it here. Well, it's not a chart from the front. What's that? I think, I think you could get a uh, chart from the front. Well, um, the goal is to get it right above the snare drum. Ah. So uh, that's going to be too hard to do otherwise. Uh, so this would be fairly close. Right? So, uh, in, in reality, it might want to be just a little higher, but um, we are going for the approximate thing here. So this is a large diaphragm condenser. We're only using microphones today that, um, that you have access to. So this is a large diaphragm condenser, but it's also a tube microphone. So we may hear, um, spatially, things may be just a little bit different on this one than they were on the other. Okay. All right, let's see what we got now. Was being lost. I felt like the ride symbol, especially, was being lost. It wasn't. It wasn't over far enough. Um, was one of the issues that I was hearing. So again, we could move that microphone around until we got a nice balance. And we're just using my, one microphone. Okay. All right. So let's keep going down the list of the things that. Uh, one other thing I noticed too, Graham. Yep. Um, and this is right off the bat. Um, watch how your drummers set their drum kits up. Um, the first thing I noticed, this, this was resting on the bass drum. If you've got metal on metal or metal on wood, what's it going to, what's the sound, what, you know, I mean, what's it going to do when it starts vibrating? It's, it's going to make some noise, you know what I mean? It's going to rattle, it's going to buzz. So look to see that there's clearance on everything, you know, that, especially if you start hearing some funky, you know, rattle noises. It's the first thing you check to see if there's stuff sitting on a drum or, you know, it's, some stands are clicking together. It's pretty common when you've got all this junk kind of crammed into one space. Okay, the second single mic technique we're going to listen to is putting a ribbon directly in front of um, directly in front of the kit, about two feet out. Uh, we're pretty close, two to three feet. So. Um, 
So let's hear what uh, let's hear what that sounds like. Accentuated bass, and why would that be? Because the ribbon mic and it emphasizes the warmth and the lower frequencies. Good. You couldn't hear the snare as loud. Couldn't hear the snare as much. So what might I consider doing, Franny? Playing it louder. Playing it louder. What might be? Moving the mic. Moving the mic. Or not. So up and over. So maybe we were getting a little too much kick drum, right, and not enough snare drum. So maybe I might consider making it so that it's aiming a little bit more at the snare drum, right? Again, we're figure eight, so we're pointing straight ahead, right? I might just do something like that. Maybe that might uh, might do a little better job. I want to hear, hear what that sounds like. Thing. Pretty good blend of kick and snare and hat. Sound like a pretty good blend of kick and snare and hat to me. Snare is coming through really tight. Maybe, uh, maybe if you hit one of these cymbals, maybe that might not be the perfect place for him. But that's a good start for a single microphone. And that's, I, th I think I'm going to skip ahead because we're running a little behind. Um, this is going to be probably one of my favorite microphone techniques for, for micing up trumps. This is a two microphone technique. Okay, so we have one ribbon that we're gonna leave out here a little bit. And we're gonna leave out here to the point where it's picking up kind of low end stuff, it's kicking up kick drum, it's picking up toms, it's doing all kind of like this area. And then I've got another mic above, right? I've got a, a, a large diaphragm condenser that's gonna be a little crisper. And I'm gonna move this one around until I have a really nice blend of cymbal, snare, and hi-hat, okay? So in my mind, I'm kind of differentiating the two roles of the two microphones. Does that make sense? Yeah. The ribbon is kind of for the low end. This uh, condenser is a little bit more for the, the top end of the sound as well as the transient, right? I mean, that's the other thing I want. I've got to have that snare drum transient. So let's, uh, let's try that. We're going to give that a shot with both microphones here. See what we got. Make sure I'm plugging in correctly. I think so. Yep. So you hear that they're they are truly functioning how, how we were hoping. They are truly functioning in the sense that they are the top
top condenser is really picking up the high end and the, the ribbon is really picking up the low end. So let's hear them and blend it together. Here they are blended together. That's just the ribbon right there. And as I bring the, the condenser in, So I have like a, a combination of those two sounds available to me later on to mix, right? And that is a very effective situation for recording drums. One of the problems, can anybody tell me a problem with this recording situation? Mono? It's only in mono. Perfect. That's, that's exactly what I'm looking for. So in a sense, if you're looking for a really uh, hi-fi sound, right, a real hi-fi sound that has a nice stereo spread and fills up all the space really well, you won't get that from this, OK? But what you do get is a lot of control over the sound. You know, a lot of control over the sound. There's not going to be any phasing problems. I'm definitely within my three to run one rule. You know, everybody familiar with the three to run rule, Morgan? Yeah, if you, uh, for every duty you bring to the party, you got to bring three chips. That's not exactly the three to run rule. <laughs> <laughs> it's very close. The, it's very it's close. Uh, I almost gave you extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> That's very close. Well, so let's try some other things while, we, uh, while, we're, while we're running through here. Um, how about we position a stereo mic in front of the palm? looking between the toms and cymbals towards the snare, all right? So we're just going to stick just this, this stereo mic, which is already conveniently set up for X, Y for us, in between the toms looking at the snare drum. OK, so that's all we're going to listen to. What kind of mic's that again? That's a uh, condenser. And, uh, <coughs> It's already uh, made into stereo and then X Y away. While he's doing that, just the moon gel. Uh, mm. Just a little. It's a little. Thing. Just little squares come in a little, little bucket. Um, better for symbols, really. <coughs> the toms, again, these are the best. Um, when they're not bent, when you got bent bends and wrinkles, that's when you get that buzz. But you're not, you know. 